What foundational courses or subjects would you recommend for someone interested in prebiotic chemistry or synthetic biology? Well, I think as an undergraduate, you'd want to take biology or biochemistry. I would prefer that you took biochemistry because you really want to understand a lot about the chemistry side uh, uh, for synthetic biology and for, for anything that has to do with prebiotic chemistry, origin of life studies. Uh, so, so at the undergraduate level, do that, but take as many courses as you can uh, uh, within the, the realm of organic chemistry uh, or, or something that interfaces with organic chemistry. And so you can take advanced courses. If you're in a university where they have a graduate program, you can often take advanced courses as a junior or senior undergraduate, and that, that you, that'll prepare you even better for graduate school. But you'll never really uh, uh, be able to, to really run a program and do something uh, really deep unless you get a PhD. That's the thing about the sciences. It's different than engineering. In the sciences, you really have to go ahead and get a PhD and often go a few years beyond the PhD, two, year, two or three years of a postdoc, uh, uh, to get even more training. And that's just the, the, the nature of it. But I think if you get your undergraduate degree in biology or biochemistry, you, you, you'll actually learn to love it. And uh, uh, then you go on gra to graduate school and you, you keep going from there. But uh, it takes a, a lot of years before you're really prepared to do in-depth things. What key skills should a chemistry student develop to contribute meaningfully to cutting edge research in molecular synthesis or origin of life studies? Well, if you want to do synthesis, you have to take organic chemistry. You usually take organic chemistry. You have to take physical organic chemistry. You have to take uh, 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 an advanced course in synthesis, as well as all the standard chemistry courses and uh, uh, physical chemistry, quantum, quantum mechanics. And, 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 uh, uh, but again, there, it depends what university you're at. There are often tracks you can take that specialize. And so they would specialize in, in uh, say, say, synthesis. And you could take more advanced courses in that. And then again, take the graduate courses if you can. When I was an undergraduate, I took every organic chemistry graduate course that, that the university offered. And that really helped to prepare me for, um, for graduate school. Uh, uh, origin of life studies are pretty exact. And, and that, that you can't really take a course. I'd be surprised if you'd have a course in that as an undergraduate. There might be a graduate course in that uh, if you had a professor at that university that worked in that particular area. Uh, but that, that, would, that would come later. And if you really wanted to work in those studies, uh, take a lot of organic synthesis and then go work for somebody that, that works in the area of origin of life, possibly as a postdoc. What does your typical day in your lab look like when you're working on molecular or nanoscale synthesis? My typical day is actually very different than, say, a graduate student or postdoc typical day. Graduate student or postdoc would be working in the lab. Most of their time is in the laboratory or using analytical equipment uh, uh, in some equipment room uh, to, to analyze something that they've made or something that they're working on. My day is I spend a lot of time just sitting in front of a computer, communicating with my group, working on manuscripts, writing manuscripts, uh, uh, and then uh, communicating with collaborators. But I spend about uh, seven hours a week uh, direct contact hours with my students. And, and uh, different prof professors are different, but you asked about my day. And so on Tuesdays, we have group meetings for two to two and a half hours. And that's where just two students will present their work in a very formal-like seminar type, type atmosphere where they're giving about a 45, 50 minute, or sometimes it'll run an hour uh, uh, lecture on their work from about the past four months. And they'll give some background and, and uh, 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 describe it in that way. And then different people in the group will ask questions. I'll ask questions. Other group members are sitting around asking questions. And this is usually at a conference room. And they're giving their talk at, at, the, uh, at a, at a uh, big widescreen TV in the room. Uh, uh, and then on Thursdays, I have direct contact hours with every one of my students. So I'm sitting in a room for about four, four and a half hours, and they come in in subgroups. I, my group is about, I guess in total, about 30 people. And uh, uh, they'll come in, in in small subgroups according to the projects that they're on. 
And so, so uh, every student has to hand in, has to email me and uh, a a report of the things that they've done that week, and they'll put in pictures of you know you know uh, scanning electron microscope pictures or NMR spectra, and we'll look over those things together in that report. But they're presenting to me eyeball to eyeball, uh, every one of my students every week, and this is good because it. It causes them to have to bring their work together. It causes them to get to know how to, to uh, uh, start explaining the work to me, uh, uh, which is an, a, an important part of what we have to do. They have to explain the work to me. And then also, if they're going in a, in a direction that's not going to be that fruitful, I can redirect them immediately. I get my students out generally from bachelor's to PhD in about four years. There's a lot of research groups that routinely take five or six years, sometimes even more. That is very rare in my group. The student has had some problem if they're approaching five years in my group. Uh, I try to really get them out right around four years. And the reason I could do that is because I have this weekly contact directly with them. And so they're presenting their work and uh, they've written the report. And so we're looking through the report together and there's other people around because I want input. It's not just my brain trying to help them and their brain. I want my whole group participating. Everyone in, and everyone in that subgroup on the Thursdays, Thursday afternoons, uh, participating with them in trying to, to figure this thing out. And then some of my day, if it's during the semester, of be in classroom three hours a week in lecture, uh, lecturing, and uh, sometimes to undergraduates, sometimes graduates, just depending on, on, on the course that's there. And then often meeting with industrial visitors, um, uh, corporate visitors, and, and uh, uh, dealing with some of the things that, that, that uh, uh, they want to present. So, and, and then I deal with, with students. Uh, I'm in my office. My students can come anytime and talk to me. If I want to talk to them, either I go to the lab or I'll call them on their cell phone and I'll say, hey, come here and let's talk about something. And we'll do that. And usually, you know, I bother them a lot more when we're working through the details of a manuscript. Or if I think of an idea, I'll, I'll call them in and I'll say, okay, grab this person and this person, come on into my office, let's talk about this. Because of you, millions of people have heard the gospel. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that he's risen from the dead, and you will be saved. That's right. That's the requirement. We talk about science concepts which draw people in. Take these nanomachines and have them drill into cells. This would be a great way to kill cancer, right? We also talk about Jesus Christ, who's the best in everything. My faith in Jesus Christ means more than me than anything. If you could continue to give or give for the first time, we would certainly appreciate Appreciate it. You can go to jesusandscience.org. Thank you so much. What is your perspective on the future of nanotechnology and its potential role in understanding life's origin? Nanotechnology used to be kind of separate. When it first came in, right in around uh, when it started really getting big in the in the late 90s, um, they, they started discrete programs within each, each funding agency for like the NSF had a nano program, the NIH had a nano program. Uh, and so, but now nano has, it no longer has discrete programs. It's all been incorporated. So it's part of what you do in any other program. It's part of what you do. And so this is part of the things that we're working on all the time. And uh, um, uh, so you may be like, like our synthetic machines, our, our little nano machines that drill into cells. I mean, we're doing a lot of cellular work. We do a lot of synthesis to make the nano machines, and then we do a lot of studies around that to get these nano machines incorporated. So this is, this is part of what we have to do here. And uh, um, uh, so nanotechnology helps with that. Now, as far as origin of life goes, I mean, in nanotechnology, you learn how to build small devices, you learn how to build these, the, these, uh, uh, um, uh, these little machines, but origin of life uh, studies, uh, you would incorporate the tools of nanotechnology, the high-resolution instruments, for example, if you wanted to study some cellular structure, uh, uh, the analytical tools that have been developed around uh, uh, dealing with nanotechnology. But uh, nanotechnology is really broad. It's not just for origin of life studies. Uh, here's another question. Aren't amino acids present on meteorites and potentially usable for the origin of life? They're absolutely present in meteorites. You find them occasionally. Most of what comes in on meteorites burns up. Uh, amino acids can come in on meteorites and you can find them. 
they're usually very small amounts and they're usually in vast mixtures of other things. And they're not just alpha amino acids. So all amino acids that our bodies use are alpha amino acids where the, 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 um, the amine group is alpha to the carbonyl group, uh, uh, just one, one carbon away. But you also find beta amino acids, gamma amino acids. You find many compounds. So they're unusable in, in anything that has to do with prebiotic chemistry. Before biology, you could not deal with mixtures because you would incorporate all of these. And they're generally racemic. Uh, if you have more than one of the molecules, they're generally racemic, meaning that you, you have both handedness. And if they do show uh, some enantiomeric excess, it's usually a small amount. And uh, 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 so, so, so you don't generally find it high. I mean, some of the highest enantiomeric excesses that I've read about are maybe 60%. And these were not even for amino acids, but, but uh, um, uh, the, the, none, none of the amino acids that, that uh, uh, are the 20 canonical amino acids that, that humans use. Uh, that biology uses. Uh, uh, and so you get, you get not just the amino acids that we want, you get a lot of amino acids that you don't want. And how those ever got segregated, we don't know. But most of them never survive. And then once they land, an amino acid just sitting out. I mean, these things, if they were, if they were uh, uh, had an high in anti-America excesses ever, they start racemizing over time. And then you have all of UV, influencing them so so and once they get into an oxygen and oxygenated atmosphere and environment and uv that would be another problem but yes they absolutely come in in very small amounts and as john sutherland said uh generally these compounds that come in of meteorites are unusable and they're unusable because they're in vast mixtures so what biology is able to do is you can take a whole handful of different supplements in the morning and, and just ingest these, and your body knows what to do with each one of these because you have enzymes. This is what biology does. Biology is amazing. Chemistry cannot do that. You have to do chemistry on pure compounds. You can't do chemistry on vast mixtures where you have 1% or less than 1% of what you want in there and have all these other things not compete with it because a carboxylic acid on one compound is gonna be just like a carboxylic acid on another compound, and the, the two are gonna have similar reactivities. Same thing with an alcohol group, with an amine group. Uh, uh, so, so all of these things compete. So generally what comes in in meteorites is totally unusable. We can identify because we have these amazing tools, but they're unusable. Thank you for joining me today. If you could give us a like, share, or podcast review, we would appreciate it. If you have any questions, you could send them to ask at jesusandscience.org, and we'll try to answer some of those questions in an upcoming video. And if you do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you want to hear about why I believe, send me an email to tour at drjamestour.org, and we'll get together by Zoom and I'll share with you why I embrace the resurrection of Jesus Christ.